Hello and welcome to the 1800 Respect webcast today. My name is Kelly and thank you for taking the time to participate. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all meeting around the nation. Today's 1800 Respect webcast is with the National Children's Commissioner, Megan Mitchell. The purpose of today's webcast is to engage people who work with children from a diversity of sectors and fields on the impacts of domestic and family violence on children. The Commissioner and her team will use the insights, feedback and comments received today to inform the 2015 Parliamentary Report into Children's Rights. This is the first time 1800 Respect has used this platform to seek feedback and insights from our audience. You could call it a reverse webinar of sorts. We thank you for taking part and we hope that you'll fill out a survey at the end of the webcast so we can determine the success of this format for future consultations. The webcast is live and interactive and throughout the webcast we encourage you to actively participate by using the feedback and question button located on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. We will share a few of the responses during the webcast to stimulate additional thoughts and comments. We may read out your first name if provided, and all contributions will be captured and used to inform the Commissioner's report. If you're experiencing difficulty with the sound during the webinar, please dial the 1800 support number that is listed on the bottom of this player page. We're now pleased to welcome our presenter for today, Megan Mitchell, as well as Siobhan Turney from the Human Rights Commission. Megan's appointment as Australia's first National Children's Commissioner marked a significant step in the protection of children in Australia. Megan's focus is the rights and interests of children and the laws, policies and programs that impact on them. She holds qualifications including a Masters in Psychology and Social Policy and has practical expertise in child protection, foster and kinship care, juvenile justice and children's services. Her previous roles include New South Wales Commissioner for Children and Young People, Executive Director of the ACT Office for Children, Youth and Family Support, Executive Director for Out of Home Care in the New South Wales Department of Community Services and CEO of the Australian Council of Social Service. I'd now like to pass over to Megan to begin. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Kelly. To begin, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in this webinar and joining me here today to take part in this important conversation about the impact of family and domestic violence of children on children. By way of introduction, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about my role as National Children's Commissioner and why I've chosen to focus on this particular issue. So as uh, Children's Commissioner, it's my role to monitor and advocate for the rights of all children in Australia under the age of 18. The work I do, of course, is informed by the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, also known as CRC or CROC uh, in Australia. This international treaty was ratified uh, by Australia back in 1990 and it is the most ratified of all international uh, human rights conventions. It has four guiding principles, non-discrimination, the child's best interests, participation, that is the right to be heard and be uh, treated seriously, and protection and survival. So this year, as part of my annual statutory report, as Kelly said, um, I am examining how children aged 0 to 17 are affected by family and domestic violence. Why have I chosen this subject? As I stated earlier, in performing my functions, I'm guided by the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And Article 19 of the Convention gives every child the absolute right to live free from all forms of violence and requires protection for children who are exposed to and witness family and domestic violence. At an international level, uh, and domestically too, over the last decade in particular, there's been growing recognition that children's exposure to family and domestic violence is a human rights issue. 
In 2012, when the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child last reported on Australia's implementation of children's rights, it expressed grave concern at our children's exposure to family and domestic violence, and in particular in regard to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and children. During 2013, which was my first year as Commissioner, I spoke to a number of children and young people around the country. Um, and, uh, and as a result uh, of that um, discussion with advocates, the issue of safety and violence was frequently raised. That's why uh, in my 2013 report, uh, family violence was uh, prioritised as an ongoing uh, area to work on. It was again raised with me when I explored the issue of intentional self-harm last year. Um, I, in that um, study, I ha held a number of round tables around the country, uh, and, along with some other work. And I recall at one round table, the police representative uh, there had examined all the suicides of children in the last year. And his advice was that in every single case, there was a domestic violence background. So in my 2014 report, I identified the intersection of intentional self-harm and family and domestic violence as an area needing, needing further research and attention. In this year, the 25th year since Australia's ratification of the Convention of the Rights of the Child, we're now experience experiencing, as you all know, a remarkable but overdue national conversation about family violence. This dialogue is being reinforced through the cooperative action of state, territory and federal governments through the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children, and also through the advocacy of champions such as Australian of the Year, Rosie Batty. As Children's Commissioner, this has provided me with the opportunity to raise the importance of children's right to live free from violence of all forms and to put a spotlight on the unique experiences of children affected by family violence. To date, my examination into this topic has involved receiving a number of submissions, collecting and analysing data and ho hosting a series of expert forums. These, along with the discussions held in this webinar, which is just a fantastic opportunity to really reach out to so many of you working in this field, will be used to contribute to the findings of my 2015 Children's Rights Report to Parliament. What do we know about this issue so far? Well, unfortunately, as in many areas uh, in relation to children's wellbeing, we don't know enough. There's no national data on the proportion of child protection notifications that relate to family violence uh, in Australia. Prevalence estimates, however, from the 2005 and 2012 personal safety surveys by the ABS shows, however, that children's exposure to family and domestic violence is widespread and predominantly associated with violence against women. For instance, the 2012 personal safety survey estimates that 17% of women and 5% of men in Australia over 15 have experienced violence by a partner. Both the 2005 and 2012 surveys show that much of the partner violence reported by women and men is seen or heard by children in their care. Children living with family and domestic violence are at an increased risk of experiencing emotional, physical and sexual abuse. And it's estimated that family and domestic violence is present in 55% of physical abuse cases and 40% of sexual abuse cases against children. As well as being direct victims of family violence, the experiences of children witnessing or being exposed to violence has increasingly been recognised as a form of child abuse. During 2013 and 14, just under 41,000 children were the subjects of substantiated child protection notifications in Australia. These are shocking figures. 40% for emotional abuse, which we all know is in most child protection systems code for exposure to domestic violence. 28% for neglect, 
19% for physical abuse and 14% for sexual abuse. You know, I did some maths on this this morning and that equates to around 112 instances of child abuse within the family context every day in this country. Children who witness domestic violence are also typically categorised of having an experience of emotional abuse, which I just mentioned. And this is likely to be one of the key reasons for the high rates of substantiated emotional abuse and the high numbers of children in care. Needless to say, experiences of family violence has a profound impact on the developing child. And many studies demonstrate the devastating impacts in terms of things like poor educational achievement, physical and mental health, and the capacity to form healthy relationships. Children, children and young people's attitudes to violence is germane in this context. Um, a recent survey uh, conducted by Our Watch on uh, children's children and young people's attitudes, and these are children and young people between 12 uh, and 24, the 3,000 of them, showed that one in three young people don't think that exerting control over someone is a form of violence. 15% think it's okay for a guy to pressure a girl for sex if they're both drunk. Uh, one in four, that's a quarter, don't think it's serious if a guy who normally is gentle sometimes slaps his girlfriend when he's drunk and they're arguing. And 16% of young people think that women should know their place. In examining this issue, I hope to develop a set of clear recommendations for government on how to be better protect our children. And I'm really grateful for your input in, into that process. I look, so look forward to hearing from all of you uh, and, and learning from your experiences and gaining from your expertise. Thanks, Skelly. Thanks, Megan. Um, we encourage you to um, provide some comments on some of the questions that we have up on screen at the moment. But while, we're, while those comments are starting to come through, Megan, can I ask you how you came to these questions? Yeah, Kelly, these are a set of questions that have been distilled by the Australian Bureau of Statistics after they, um, they looked at a range of research, research questions in the area of vi uh, family violence and down from 100 research questions, these are the ones that they came up with, with the pretty critical ones. And so we're using these to guide discussions uh, in these kinds of forums, including our roundtables that we're holding around the country. Fantastic. Now, we do have a comment that's just come through from Maggie, and I'd like to read that out to you, um, Megan. Maggie says, um, as part of her submission, that I have come to the personal view that majority of young males diagnosed with schizophrenia in particular, but mental health diagnosis in general, have the commonality of living in the war zone of domestic violence as children, and that this is therefore the single largest contributing factor to their mental ill health. Comment from Maggie. Well, certainly it's a very astute observation and certainly within the round tables that we've been holding and also in terms of the submissions we've been receiving, the long-term impact of being exposed to domestic violence as a child is, is, is coming out and emerging and, you know, um, you know, I think that you know, the research is pretty clear that this, the impact of family violence even uh, starts to have an impact in utero and has a significant impact on brain development of children uh, and, and is a barrier to the health, optimal brain development and healthy development of, of young people, children and young people. Okay. Maggie, Maggie also goes on to say, another, uh, points to another of our questions that I'll bring up on the screen. She, she says that a number of programs, if, if a number of programs also targeted the perpetrator and held him 100% accountable, then if we don't hold programs like this, then she feels that nothing is really going to change. Unfortunately, here in WA, the recognition of family domestic violence as a child abuse issue is likely to result in more children being removed from their primary attachment figure, as the tendency is to expect the mother to keep her children safe. The presumption being that leaving the perpetrator is the only step she can take to keeping her child safe. 
She says, we used to run attachment groups for mum and children and these were evaluated at the time, but resources prevented us in monitoring the ongoing impact. Yeah, another great comment. Um, and there's two issues there that Maggie is raising. One is the widespread perception, and I think it's the reality, um, of blaming the victim and where women are in particular are deemed not to demonstrate adequate protective behaviours for their children, often with the um, outcome that the child is removed and placed in the care system. And uh, as opposed to child protection systems, really thinking about how we can help the woman and that child be safe. Um, the other issue that Maggie raises there, which is also emerging, is the need uh, to uh, deal with the impact on uh, the damaged relationship between the parents and the child from exposure to domestic violence and in particular issues around attachment and bonding which aren't necessarily uh, or universally attended to uh, in, the, in, in terms of the, the, the mother and the child getting the support they need. Great. We have another question that's come through, again on this same question. Yeah. And Vanessa asks, I know that money has been allocated to the National <coughs> Community Education Campaign under the National Plan. Have you heard of any successful campaigns for children experiencing family violence? Uh, look, um, one of the really important uh, inputs to this uh, webinar today is getting people's views about what would work in this educational space. There's a wide range of views out there. Uh, some support um, uh, strong broad-based messages about healthy relationships or um, and what how to behave in front of children and the impacts of that. Uh, others believe that you really need quite nuanced and targeted uh, programs uh, for different populations of people. So I'm really keen to hear what other people have to say. And the, the opportunity here is immense because there's been $30 million um, allocated for this purpose. So we really need to get that right. Mm. And so we really need to get the views of people who work in this field about what's going to work in that space. We have another comment here from Russell who asks, what can be done to improve the collection of accurate data to help inform our decision making? Yeah, um, that's a good point, Russell. Um, uh, we don't have a lot of data, uh, in, in particular uh, in terms of child wellbeing. Um, the police around the country don't routinely collect that, so I guess that's one of the things, that the, the areas of potential recommendations I can make in terms of consistent well, collection of data in the first place mm. about children who are impacted, uh, but also uh, consistency around the country so we can get a bit of a national picture about what's going on for children. And, you know, that study by um, uh, the Our Watch group in terms of children's attitudes, um, there's not many of those studies that actually go to y the, the attitudes of younger children, and I think you really do need to find out what children are thinking and experiencing mm. quite young in life. Mm. I'm just going to switch over to some more questions, but I have another comment that's come through while I put those questions up on the screen. Uh, Holly. Holly's got a comment and she says, over a third, or 34% to be accurate, of children displaying problem sexual behaviour or sexually abusive behaviour who have attended our sexual assault support service have experienced family violence within the home. We need to be aware of this connection and that children who have experienced family violence may display this behaviour as acting out, as an acting out response to this violence. That's an incredibly important observation and I think making the link between family violence in the home and, you know, um, the modelling of either perpetrator behaviour uh, or um, victim behaviour um, as well as the acting out response. And in fact, a number of uh, round tables that I've, we've held so far have talked about the fight or uh, flight situation that these children find themselves in. They're, they're either, and they're constantly in this mode, which means that they really don't have a lot of opportunity to have normal, healthy, uh, developmental, uh, you know, pathways. And, but part of that is 
you know, if they're in a fight mode, often that can be an acting out mm -hmm. uh, behaviour. And if they're in their flight mode, they can get withdrawn and anxious. And, and all of these things are associated in many cases with their exposure to violence in the home. Mm. Mm. Well, Megan, you just referenced the roundtables that you've conducted. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about the process involved in the roundtables and how they've been conducted. Sure. So we're holding eight altogether around the country. Um, we can only, you know, get a sort of 30, 20 to 30 people in the room. So this is like the biggest round table of all with hundreds of people in it, uh, and which is fantastic. Um, and we have, and so we're going to every state and territory. We're actually talking to individual stakeholders as well as input. And, um, and we've had all sorts of people from academics to researchers uh, in this area, educationalists, the police. Um, you know, everybody, people from uh, the domestic violence sector, of course, people like Our Watch and Anne Rose are intimately involved in the process as well. Mm. So uh, we finish up uh, this week, which is great because it's a very tiring process <laughs> as well as a very informative process. Uh, and we'll be getting, getting on with writing that report to Parliament, which is a statutory report. It uh, goes to all parliamentarians, so it's a really good opportunity to get this issue right in front of of parliamentarians who make decisions about where resources go in particular. Mm. Okay. When is the report um, yeah. being tabled? Uh, it's being tabled in October and it'll but it will be um, launched in December. There's a sort of a parliamentary process that it needs to go through. We have another comment that's come through yeah. that I'd like to share. Uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth asks, outcomes for rural and regional children are tied to access to support services and support. Where there are no support services for children, there are no outcomes. Mm -hmm. That's a comment. Uh, it also goes to the issue that Russell raised too about measurement. Like if we're not, if, if there are no services that children are accessing, we don't know what their experiences are and we don't know what they're missing out on as well. So if you don't measure something, you know, you don't care about it so much. Mm. That doesn't mean it's not happening. Mm. So it's a really important um, issue to raise. And, you know, from what we're seeing too, that isolation in those rural communities mm. can compound children's experience, uh, negative experiences of family violence. And, and in some communities, lateral violence, it's not just within the, you know, behind a closed door, it's out on the street, you know, that's their experience, uh, is, is, is all around them all the time. And mm. that's very problematic. And yes, I think it's really important that um, we highlight how we might be able to support those kids uh, in those areas. Um, and obviously, um, technology and digital technology might provide some uh, opportunities there, uh, mm. for instance, through helplines like the Kids Helpline. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, well, another comment now, uh, which pertains to question three that was posed to participants. Um, sorry, not a comment, it's a question. Yeah, and okay. Dee asks, um, are we any closer to getting education in the schooling system? <laughs> this would offer support for children living in domestic violence and offer education for future generations. Yes, well, um, I, th I think we are probably closer. Um, I understand it's been discussed at a ministerial level. And certainly I know that, you know, um, as a result of Rosie Batty and others campaigning to have respectful relationships and what is a healthy relationship and what is not a healthy relationships in the school settings and in the community settings too, you know, there has been a commitment by New South Wales at least uh, in the high school setting. But, you know, she and I have discussed this needs to happen a lot earlier. And there's plenty and ample opportunity in the uh, national curriculum for it to happen without it being uh, an additional burden on, on teachers. Um, you know, relationships, navigating relationships starts from day one, you know, for a child. So there's lots of opportunities in the home, in the schools to be modelling and teaching about what a respectful relationship looks like. And, you know, um, that's something I will obviously raise in my report. Yeah. We, have, we have another one that's come through, um, Megan, and yeah. it's from Annabelle. Annabelle asks, we know that one size does not fit all in service delivery. In context of children with special needs and disabilities, they are at risk, um, that are at risk, yet there aren't appropriate options 
where the carer parent can make decisions to break patterns of violence where children can be supported as well. Do you want me to repeat that or? No, mm. I, I get it, I mm. think. Um, and so, so you've got a sort of a compounding sort of situ uh, thing that's going on for parents and children with disabilities. Uh, and obviously many of those carers are going to be isolated mm. as well and not necessarily have a great support network around them. So, uh, you know, I'll take it as a comment that it compounds, you know, the problematic nature of this. You, you've, got, you pre, you've got to be protective to this child who's, who's got a disability and, and you might therefore not uh, um, be supported to deal with the violence issues around it. And often the kids are, are also um, disadvantaged and disempowered if they have communication or other difficulties as well. Mm. I mean, I think in that sense, that leads me to another sort of thematic that's been coming up, of the importance of gatekeepers, the importance of people like teachers, neighbours, um, you know, person in the local shop, your GP, in order to get greater skills and knowledge within those mm. often first to yes. know respondents to be able to ask questions that will help uh, people come forward and get help because... I think people just stay silent because yes. they're shamed or they're worried about what will happen to them. Or they don't know what to do. Or they don't know what to do. They don't know what yeah. services are out there if there are any. And uh, so I think it's really important that that issue is explored too. What can gateway people do to skill themselves up and ask sensitive questions, supportive questions mm -hmm. to somebody who, mightn't, mm -hmm. who might be going through this? Yeah. yeah. Very important. Um, and now another, this is a, a bit of a complex comment, so I'll go through it slowly. This is a comment from Moana, or Mona, apologies if I pronounced it incorrectly. Um, and she says, uh, when I talk to children and young people about domestic and family violence, the common thread is choice. Secondly, family norms where children feel that their family and peers acting and enacting violently washes over them and is normal. When I look at outcomes, I go to early intervention and prevention practice, coming from mentoring and modelling. Breaking the norms for these families has been the biggest barrier. So a comment about normative issues. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. Uh, and so the issue for our, us is, as a society, how do, what is the most effective way of breaking that down? And um, some of the things that have been suggested through the roundtable and submissions are things like uh, increasing understanding among uh, parents in particular about the impact of their behaviour on children, children's brain development, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, these seem to have uh, promised, they have promised these sorts of interventions because parents generally don't want to be bad parents. Mm -hmm. And, and that can be the breakthrough moment when they realise that actually what we're doing, how we're behaving, what I'm doing, is actually having a really detrimental impact on my child. And just to, um, I, I just want to relay a bit of a story that I recently was talking to a bunch of kids who uh, were in care, and many of them who were in care as a result of coming from a, uh, a, a, a violent family. And uh, this one lovely young man, he was uh, like 14 or 15, uh, he was asked about how he, um, you know, how it was that he settled into his foster family, because he was with a foster family. And he said, and, and what that foster families can do to help kids who come from these backgrounds. And he, he said, well, you know, when I first got there, I didn't know what to do because no one was yelling and screaming or hitting each other and so I was really agitated and, and, um, and I don't think they understood why I was like that and I couldn't settle uh, and couldn't sleep because I just expected everybody to sort of erupt every moment. Um, and so this had become normative, norm, the norm for him, yeah. um, which goes back to the question. Um, and, and later he was, and so he was saying it's really important that people who don't experience this don't judge and, 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 and take seriously, you know, the impact that it has on kids uh, and let them settle. <laughs> but it does take time to recover. Mm. And he was asked, well, how did you get to the point where it was okay? And he said, well, after a while, the calm just caught on. Mm. And it was oh. such a lovely mm. moment because that's what we need to give to kids. 
calmness. Mm. <laughs> Give them mm. environments where they can thrive and be themselves, not when they're in this fight or flight, mm. yep. you know, ang uh, situation all the time. Sure. Mm. Yeah. Great. Okay. Annabelle. Annabelle's got uh, has a has a comment. Mm -hmm. Yes, the needs for families who have children. Oh, so we think we've gone through that one. I think it's reiterating a point that oh, was made Oh, it's reiterating. Mm. Um, it also means that there needs to be services that have adequate resources to meet the broad range of needs for families. So again, it's reiterating the comment made earlier for families who have children with disabilities or special needs. Yeah. So I might jump to the next one. Uh, Amanda. Amanda asks, education of police in particular is required. I've been a victim of domestic violence as a young child, teenager, and in my first marriage, and now my grandchildren are victims. Police attitudes have barely changed in 40 years, she feels. The understanding, I understand they are going to be frustrated with people who do not change their behaviours, but this is not the fault of the children who are living in some very horrid situations. It's a really good point, and, and while... Um I can't comment on the 40 years um, observation. Um, I have come across lots of people in the police that are very attuned to this issue and really want to do something about it. Um, you know, they're, they're put in some really difficult situations and they see the impact on the kids. And uh, I think there's a lot of goodwill out there in the context of this broad national conversation that we're having at the moment um, to really create some champions within the police. And that's why one of the great things about that um, advisory group that the Prime Minister set up with Rosie Batty on it also has Ken Lay on it. Mm. And I think that's a really great development. Um, you know, there are champions out there and, and I think we should uh, help them uh, to make changes in that space and really, again, skilling up the police. I mean, a lot of the young constables on the beat really don't know what to do in those situations, mm. never been in those situations before. So we really need to give them knowledge and skills. Mm. Yeah, and think. Ken's definitely made some, some inroads as well. Yeah, he has. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here from Mariam, who asks that uh, early childhood education and the care sector is a female-dominated one, with educators being perceived as carer, as a traditional women's job. They also are not paid professionally, which eventually contributes to gender stereotypes. Research shows domestic violence is rooted in gender inequality. I am wondering whether this is an area to look at, so that educators teaching zero, children aged zero to five can be great role, role models of equality in the society. So going back to education there. Yeah, look, it's really important. Um, the, the gendered nature of power imbalance is clear, uh, and we do need to address that. Uh, obviously, early childhood educators have a particular role to play and of, often it's a, um, a very trusted relationship between mm. the child and, and those educators, a play-based relationships as well. Mm. Uh, so I guess, you know, one of the, the challenges for early childhood educators, and I have a lot of colleagues uh, in that area, uh, is to check yourself when you're, uh, you know, when you're uh, cementing the gendered re, uh, response to things. I mean, I know for my own, uh, in, it, I have to do it myself so that I'm not always buying the pink tutu for my great niece, uh, even though I'm very attracted to it. I really got to try and think about what the impacts of all of those sorts of gendered responses mm. to things that we sure. all have in us, mm. uh, ha the impacts it has down the track in terms of, you know, the uh, imbalance, power imbalances in, 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 the, in the world. And, and I do think too that the comment about early childhood educators, it would be great to get more men in that space, but part of the, uh, and part of the reason there aren't is because it's not particularly well played. Mm. Uh, so I do think that's an area too, and to really uh, increase the professionalisation of the education sector generally. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We have another comment and it relates again to, to the police force. Donna Sander asks or makes a comment that I've been educating police on attitudes in Victoria with no funding from the force to do so. How do we educate the many siloed systems that intervene in domestic violence in sensitive evidence-based best practice? 
The system matters at all levels, the family court, child protection, magistrates court protection orders, sensitive, non-judgmental, non <laughs> non <laughs> response that is victim and child sensitive. There are also more trauma responses than flight or fight to exposure to family yeah, violence. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, uh, it's more of a comment. I don't have the answer to it, and I'm hoping all of you do. Um, but certainly it's something that I'm trying to explore. How do we um, integrate um, uh, training, development, knowledge within all those various sectors that you've outlined? And there's more as well. How do we not see this as just an issue for the domestic violence sector, because it isn't. Mm. Um, how do we get the teacher? How do we get the GP? How do we get the police yeah. uh, and everybody else uh, up to speed on these issues? And, and in particular, mm. the impacts of trauma on, 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 children's, um, on children's experience and lives. Uh, and uh, in that context, there are some good promising programs around. Uh, and interventions, uh, then there's not a great deal of evidence. There are some, but there is not a great deal. So I guess part of the part of the suite of recommendations I'll be making will go to making sure we've got a much better evidence base uh, in order to roll out and scale up the kind of training uh, that we need. And you know, you point to the family court, and um, that's another area where seem to be um, an area where we need to develop knowledge, skills, uh, able, ability to recognise and respond to family violence and its impacts uh, much better than it is at the moment. Mm. But many institutions, I mean this has come up about many of the institutions that we all, you know, use and go about and, mm. and, and be part of every day. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, here's another comment that sort of speaks to the need to recognise the impact of trauma. This is mm. a, a comment from Lee who says, uh, children and young people are exposed to domestic violence often for a significant period of their lives. Services need to have the opportunity to work with families long term in order to make significant change to hold and to support. Short term work with families with long term violence is always going to be a challenge and perhaps a band-aid approach. Yeah. I thank Lee for the comment, and uh, I think that's right. I mean, in, in so many areas where children have experienced trauma, um, you know, our responses are short and d dealing with the incident, not dealing with the impact, and mm. we really need to be in there for the long haul uh, with families and with kids. Mm. Yeah, I can only agree. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Elizabeth, Elizabeth comments or asks the question, child protection, child safety services and caseworkers, both government and non-government, do collect data in their safety and risk assessments. Is there a move to collect this data nationally? Um, yeah, look, I think there are opportunities here. Um, I know there's another framework that I didn't mention um, when I was speaking to you, um, and that was the National Framework for Protecting Australia's Children. And it's been one of my quests is to try and link these two frameworks much more closely together mm. because they are related. Um, and, and there's a suite of work under that that is related to trying to getting getting unit record data about what's happening to children mm. uh, so that we can have uh, much better information, such as in safety assessments, etc. Mm. So it's it's though it's slow work, you know, to get all the states and territories to agree to these these kinds of improvement. But you know, it's on the agenda, and there have been um, some developments in that area. And I'll certainly add it into the uh, into the mix in terms of what I'm thinking about recommending. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Well, another comment on a very similar, yeah. in a similar vein, um, Rosie makes the comment that the lack of data is really informed by the disjointed management of these children. In younger, ch in younger children, once care and protection intervene, often they are no longer involved with the health services. This prevents the ongoing assessment of children. Health uses a number of screening tools such as ASQ, which can highlight any delays in areas such as social and emotional behaviour. There needs to be a consistent approach to the management of these kids so that an ongoing 
monitoring and support can continue, pardon me, so that ongoing monitoring and support can continue, which will aid in the gathering of statistical evidence. Which yeah, is. well, uh, yeah, I agree. And mm. um, again, uh, where those two frameworks intersect is is often around this data, um, this this information gathering, so we do get consistency, uh, and that we get the quality data that we need. But it also goes to ensuring that all the players are working together. And I certainly know that under the National Framework for Protecting Australia's Children, family violence is a priority for the next um, action plan. Mm. It's the third action plan in that series. And, and certainly there's work going on in the child protection space within the National Plan to reduce mm. violence against women and children. So they're coming together in helpful ways, I think, for the first time. We have another comment about data. I think the main gap in data collection is that each organisation has its own referral in intake. Perhaps a common tool. Also, organisations are not currently funded to work together so that goal setting is realistic. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to hear more about the referral and intake area. Um, it doesn't seem, you know, out of the... Uh, picture that we could standardise these things. Um, it also would mean that people don't have to tell their stories a million times, um, mm -hmm. you know, if they've got information that they can exchange. And I think perhaps information exchange is part of the, the answer here too, uh, between systems and between organisations yeah. that are supporting or, or, or um, managing uh, people uh, who are affected by family violence, including children. Mm. Mm. Um, You're I doing have... a great job by the way, <laughs> filtering all the questions. Um, I have here another comment that uh, reiter reiterates something that was said earlier. Um, Amanda says, I agree champions are needed, uh, but frontline police need the skills, as was noted before. Yeah. So yeah. it's just another point that was made. And just another um, short comment. Meredith says that we have a world-class universal surveillance and support service for infants and young children, maternal parent. So just another comment. Yeah, I do think uh, that's right. I, I think the um, uh, maternal health system, yeah. uh, especially the home visiting systems where they exist in some states and territories, provide a real opportunity mm -hmm. to get in early and, and it, it preventative opportunity, um, mm -hmm. but also if things are not going so well um, and also during pregnancy where we know it's a high risk time for violence, uh, it's a real opportunity to get in there with you know, with somebody who you might trust and build a relationship with. Uh, so I think, yeah, you can't underestimate the value of the child maternal health system in this area. As yeah. you were alluding to before, asking the right questions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had I, well, I had recently been talking to a woman who, um, all through a pregnancy, was experiencing um, family violence, and. She would go along to appointments and things, mm. but the bloke would come with her mostly, so she really had an opportunity to be by herself because it was quite controlling behaviour. Mm. But she indicated that there was, some, there was a couple of times where she was alone with an allied health professional or somebody else, and she really wanted them to ask her a question. Yes. She never told until, you know, much later, but yep. she really wanted them to ask her a question. Yep. And they didn't. Maybe mm. they didn't know how as yep. well. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, we've had a number of responses come in that pertain to the issue of family law matters. Yep. Um, just to go through a few of them. Um, Linda asks, why does the family court place the right of fathers to have a relationship and access to their child above the need to protect children from violence and detail some of our own experiences in that area. And we have a couple of others with similar yeah, stories. Um, Did you want to comment on that, Megan? Well, I mean, I, I do get lots of representations about the people's experiences with the family law system mm. uh, and um, the struggles uh, that um, mothers in particular and their children go through. and. Um, I would say that um, the Family Law Act, it's important to note, did um, change in 2012 uh, and in those changes were uh, provisions to better protect 
children uh, who are affected by family violence. Mm. So the court is actually obliged now uh, to privilege the safety of children um, and also to hear the voices of children. The extent to which they're able to do that is another question. And certainly, as I alluded to before, I do think that there's a long way to go before we could be confident that they're well equipped to uh, identify violence and respond to it uh, in, in ways that's, that's, um, that's going, that, that we're all confident about. Um, so certainly this, these issues come up a lot and I'm aware of them. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Megan. Yeah. Jamie again asks, she, um, asks, for children to receive counselling after separation usually requires the consent of both parents. Under the Family Law Act, mm -hmm. parents are presumed to share responsibility for their children after separation, even when one parent has used violence against the other. I'll just comment on that. Um, I, the wording of the, the Act currently relates, talks about each parent having a meaningful relationship with the child. Now the issue is how that's interpreted. And so I think there might be scope here to redefine what a meaningful relationship um, looks like when there's safety issues involved. Uh, so I think there's scope to be talking to the court about how that uh, might be uh, reconsidered uh, in, terms of the, um, in terms of the child's access uh, to both parents. In terms of counselling, this is something else that I, I understand um, is the case, that counselling is often not supported or encouraged uh, where it really should be provided um, mm. to the child. And so I think this is another area to explore with the family court about how we might be able to ensure that the children get the support they need when they need it. And on a different note, we have a yeah. comment that was... Um, Oh, sorry. My apologies. Jumped up. I, I've gone and moved the question. Technical problem. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Kelly, did you want to ask the next yes, question? Yes. Um, oh, we've got another comment from Rosie here. Um, a lot of these vulnerable family programs with maternal and child health are severely underfunded. When we start early, we can have positive outcomes would be great if some of this money could be siphoned to this program. So she's alluding to your earlier yeah. comment. Thank you, Rosie. Oh, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do think that's an area where we can actually either de-escalate a situation that's, you know, getting out of hand or we can prevent um, the stresses uh, coming in on people and this, you know, violent behaviour starting in the first place. And I know Christian has also commented yeah. uh, on a similar vein, saying that prevention is better than cure. Yeah. This needs to be put into policy of children being educated on relationships, respect and child rearing. This needs to be introduced from a young age. Teachers need to be specifically trained in these topics and it needs to be part of the higher school, higher school curriculum from year seven. As I see all of this in my role as an early childhood educator, and spent most of my time supporting and educating families instead of spending time educating children. Yeah, well, I think um, that just shows the complexity of contemporary life and contemporary families and that, yeah, I mean, the education is often of the parents as well as the children and this is why educators have such an important role to play because mm. they'll often know that something's going on the child will disclose and you know they've got a duty of care to try and respond in a in a meaningful way and protect that child mm -hmm. and often it's the best way is to change the behavior of the parents yeah yeah I think we've got time for just a few more comments mm -hmm. and then um, we'll have to start to move on um, all right then uh, there's a, a comment here from Lisa the Maternal and Child Health nurse, Nursing Service in Victoria is an ideal platform to improve identification and safety for women and children exposed to family violence. More support is needed for nurses to provide care. It's just a comment from Lisa. Yay. Yay, <laughs> <nurses>. <laughs> And I hope I pronounced this right. Mesa um, 
but she's got a she's got a comment about um, culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. So families from culturally diverse backgrounds experience family and domestic violence. However, culturally and linguistically appropriate services are very limited or do not exist, especially anger man management and conflict resolution programs for men. This is about access and equity, and I wonder if this is an area you're going to look at. Certainly I will, Nasa. Um, and thank you for raising it. Um, it's clear that a number of children in culturally and linguistically diverse families are experiencing quite high rates of violence. Uh, they certainly, in my last year's study, in terms of self-harm, they're well overrepresented as well. So I find that they're also, in terms of some of the early data that we're getting through, that children are seeking help uh, from these backgrounds as well. And yes, you're right, um, the specialist services um, that, that are friendly and culturally competent in this space are very limited. So I think it's something that I must raise and I will raise. Yeah. Great. Do two more? Um, yep, yeah, sure. Uh, how can we make sure that the funding... Sorry, this is a comment, a question from Caroline. How can we make sure that the funding for prevention lasts for longer than 12 to 24 months? So projects, uh, projects that can be set up to last for a period of five to ten years. Well, I think that is the value of having national plans which engage all the states and territories and mm -hmm. that go beyond political cycles. This is where we can get long-term commitments to things. Um, you know, I know that people can get quite cynical about plans, mm -hmm. but these two plans together, the protection of children and the reduction of, of uh, violence against women and children, together they've got a real opportunity at this moment in time with all of your support uh, to actually make a difference beyond those limited funding cycles or political cycles. So I think this is a really important moment of time to seize the day here. Fantastic. Yeah. I might um, end on this comment <laughs> yeah. from Mim. And Mim asks or comments that surely family violence counselling and education could be part of all education, including tertiary, for the service providers, considering there are domestically violent people in all occupations. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at, if you, you know, if you look at the figures around who's perpetrating this violence, you know, in any workplace there's going to be somebody in the office who is in this situation and they are likely to have children and those children are going to be, um, you know, exposed to violence. So yes, it's, it's more common than we think. Mm. It's all around us. Uh, and uh, the question was again about... It's a comment, but yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I do think it is everybody's responsibility to be aware of it and to be able to respond to it, and in particular to protect children in these circumstances and offer support. Mm. That's a good good one yeah. to end on good, in yeah. terms of comment. Yeah. So now, um, would you like to... Look, I just wanted to say thank you for everyone. I mean, if you've got other issues you want to raise, really just email me at the Human Rights Commission. So. Um, I'm megan.mitchell at humanrights.gov.au and there's also a kids at humanrights.gov.au as well. If you've got any follow-up comments, we, we've recorded all of this, so all of this information um, will be fed into my report, which will be launched in December, as I, mm. as I noted. Um, and look, gee, thanks everybody for, um, for being available and, and coming on board the webinar today. Thank you. And thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Megan, for <laughs> your presentation. Siobhan. And thank you, Siobhan, <laughs> as well. And um, thank you to everyone again for attending and contributing to today's webcast. Please find available on the bottom right-hand corner of the player page a resource library that contains some very useful resource links to assist you to support women and children experiencing the impacts of domestic and family violence. These include what is domestic and family violence, how does domestic and family violence affect children, and children and young people, where do I find support? We also encourage you to share DAISY, which is an innovative app that connects women to support services. We're pleased to announce that DAISY 2 will be released to the App Store and Google Play at the end of August. The ne this next iteration of the DAISY app will include an SMS call a friend function, which will particularly help women in rural and remote areas to access support if police are not a first response. 
It'll also include in-language information across 28 language groups and text or voice functionality for women with hearing impairments or low literacy. For more information about DAISY, it uh, can be found on the White 800 Respect website. Please stay logged in to take our online survey. The survey button is located in the bottom right hand corner. We thank you in advance for your feedback and we wish you all a very pleasant afternoon. Thank you.